Wednesday night, I almost got done with chapter two. And so I will finish chapter two. Just got a few more comments to make about um, Nebuchadnezzar's response. And then we're going to consider the burning fiery furnace. So <clears throat> at the end of that section, at the end of section verse 45, we were talking about how that the, the legs of iron and the feet of clay, the legs of iron represented the Roman Empire, but the feet of clay and the ten toes actually represents a yet future kingdom, which is going to be the revived Roman Empire of um, the day of Antichrist. And so... That's where we ended on that. And then Nebuchadnezzar, he hears Daniel telling him about the dream and tells about the interpretation. And he's just absolutely fascinated, of course. So in verse 46, uh, Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel. Now ain't that something. I mean, ain't that a cat's meow? Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the Babylonian Empire, the first world empire. Nobody in the world, humanly speaking, has got more power than Nebuchadnezzar. Nobody's got more wealth. Nobody's got more anything. And he falls down and worships or attempts to worship Daniel. Now that's saying something. Let me make a point about that. You get this mental image of Nebuchadnezzar sitting on his throne, right? And that thing might be an ivory pearl. No telling how many elephants it took to build that throne. But he gets off his throne and bows down inappropriately to worship Daniel. But of course, he's worshiping God, but I mean, he's inappropriate in what he's doing. But my point is, Nebuchadnezzar is getting off his throne to worship God. He's seen something in Daniel. Yes, he did. But here's my Here's the spiritual application, the point I'd like to make about that. I think a lot of times we need to get off our throne. Whatever we're sitting on, whatever we think we all high and lifted up and almighty, we need to get off of it. Like we got some kind of sitting on the throne of arrogance or sitting on the throne of I think I'm better than somebody. I mean, we can come up with a whole list of what you're sitting on. What kind of throne are you sitting on? You better get off of it. I'm reminded of um, uh, Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? He said, I ain't going to go preach them in a box. I don't like them. They, they mean. They skin people alive. I hate them. Don't like them. And so he tears off and goes the other way. Well, we need to know the story. But Jonah eventually walks through Nineveh. And that city is so large, it takes him three days to walk through it. And what does the Bible say? The whole city repented. Kevin, the Bible says that the king, the, the then king of Nineveh, got off his throne. He got off his throne of arrogance and pride. I just think there's a good spiritual application right here in that if we're sitting on some kind of throne, we need to get off of it. I don't know if it's pleasing, pleasing to God. But he's overwhelmed by Daniel's interpretation and he's treating Daniel like a god. It says that he offered commanded they should present an offering and incense to Daniel. Well, that's a sure sign that he was treating Daniel 
like a god because incense, of course, was what you would you burn the incense and the smoke rising up was an offering to God or your prayers are going to God. And that's what he was doing here is offering an incense to Daniel. So he was literally treating him like a God. Now it doesn't say, but you can bet uh, with 100% assurity that Daniel wasn't going to have no, no part of that. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar may have attempted to worship Daniel like a God, but Dan Daniel wasn't going to have that, of course. And so it doesn't say that we can be sure that he didn't allow uh, worship of, a, of himself. And the reason that he would reject being worshipped, Daniel's already demonstrated he, he's not scared of what Nebuchadnezzar thinks. <laughs> he, he's standing on the truth, right? He's not concerned if Nebuchadnezzar is going to get mad if he disallows a worship of him. He wasn't scared of Nebuchadnezzar before, and he ain't scared of him now. And so Daniel does not accept um, that worship. Now, another point I want to make here, Nebuchadnezzar says he promoted him Uh, the king says to Daniel, Truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you can reveal this secret. Now, is Nebuchadnezzar actually confessing his faith in God here? The only true God? I don't think so. Um, I mean, this is pretty good evidence that he's like maybe coming around. He's certainly acknowledging that um, that there, that this is a powerful God. But um, studying the original Hebrew, I had to make a note of this because I knew I wouldn't remember. The Hebrew wording, according to the Hebrew scholars, is in the absolute state versus the emphatic state. And I'm not no Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar either. I'm not even an English scholar. But the wording here would indicate that Nebuchadnezzar is recognizing that God is one of many gods, although a very powerful one. A, a God that has the ability to reveal secrets. Now in chapter 3, we're also going to see Nebuchadnezzar say something similar to this. And but I don't think he's um, confessing that the God of the Hebrews, God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is the only true God. But Kevin, I believe by the time we get to chapter 4, he may actually admit it. Change his mind. <laughs> yeah. I believe you can make a case, and we'll, when we get there, I will comment on it in more detail. But I think I could make a case that Nebuchadnezzar actually might have um, confessed his faith in God. It ain't here. It's not in chapter 3 either. But it may be that he actually did. We'll see when we get there. All right, so he's not, I don't think at this point that he's making the God of Daniel, you know, the God of the Hebrews, the only true God. I don't think he's there yet. But I think it's possible eventually that he does. And I'll make a case for that and we can all decide. All right, so in verse 49, Daniel is made prime minister. Also in that day, if you were made prime minister, you second. That's, that's sort of like uh, Joseph in Egypt, right? He was made prime minister. Only, only the Pharaoh had more power than Joseph. Daniel's made prime minister. Nobody else in the whole empire has more power than Daniel. Wow. Here, here is like a captive from, from Jerusalem. And now he's prime minister. 
same stories told about Joseph, right? He winds up in prison, falsely accused, but then before you know it, he's prime minister of Egypt. <coughs> Only God can do something like that. God's power. God's power. Second in command. And he's made ruler, it says, over all of the wise men. Look at what verse 48 says. He's promoted, gave him a lot of great gifts. I'm sure he became wealthy. Is there anything wrong with that? No. No. I wish I was a wealthy farmer like Kevin. I mean... <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. It's, it's how you use your yeah, wealth. Work for it, didn't you? Yeah, that would be a good thing. Work for it. <clears throat> so he's, he's, he becomes rich and he made him ruler of the whole province, chief administrator. Here's the point I want to make. Chief administrator over all the wise men, the magi, the magicians. What kind of implication is that? What implication does that give? In Matthew chapter 2, the Magi from the Far East, from Babylon area, are traveling to see Jesus and worship him who was born king of the Jews because they had learned of him or read about him where do you think they got their information from Daniel I guarantee you Daniel's now second in command the culture and everything that the magi were studying or their their philosophies all that changed I'll guarantee you Daniel taught them about the God of the Bible. And it shows up 580 years later. Because that's the length of time from now to the birth of Jesus Christ. The Magi show up looking for him that was born king of the Jews. Because they knew. And it's because of Daniel's testimony. That is profound. That is profound. Here's the point. Do you see what kind of influence that you can have while you're here? In your circle of influence, in your sphere of influence, you can have a profound influence that will last and last and last. When Jesus saw the woman at the well, she said to Jesus that Jacob dug that well. Hundreds of years before. And the well is still being used. To this day, today, that well is located. It is very well known. And you can get a drink of water out of it today. And Jacob digged that well 4,000 years ago. 3,500 years ago. You see the point? We are well drillers. We have the opportunity, we have the power to influence people for a long time long time. Daniel was that kind of guy. Wow. That's a profound, profound influence. I think it's worthy of us um, considering what kind of influence that we have. What kind of wells are we drilling? Are they poison wells? Or are they sweet wells? And how long can people drink out of the wells we dig? For Daniel, it was six, nearly 600 years that his influence was 
that showed up at the birth of Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 3. So here's the very well-known story of Shadrach, who was Hananiah, Meshach, who was Mishael, and Abednego, whose Hebrew name was Azariah. And these three Hebrew boys, and I'll refer to them just like that. I think um, I picked that up from people I've stu studied behind and read behind them three Hebrew boys. What a profound group of boys these, these were. And so them three Hebrew boys were thrown into a fiery furnace. And we've heard the Sunday school lessons and we've heard the sermons. And I have a sermon. I have five sermons. And I've always told Greg that if you wake up sick one morning and you scrape in the bottom of the barrel, I got five sermons. I can preach one of them. <laughs> and it's called, it's, it's about uh, chapter, chapter 3, and the title of the sermon is Stand Up or Shut Up. That's the title of that sermon. And so we've heard all those Sunday school lessons and we've heard the sermons uh, preached on this topic and I, th I think we'll, the take home message for chapter 3 is going to be that we're all going to be tested in a, in a furnace and, and this um, thing that we call life is a furnace and sometimes that furnace is hot sometimes it's seven times hotter we think but um, the fiery trials of life are going to come they have come, and they're going to continue to come. I always like what David Jeremiah said about the trial of life. You either just got out of one, you in one, or they want to come. And that, that's life. And there's no better uh, place to be than right inside of God's will when the trials will show up, and they will show up. It is promised. It's absolutely promised. We're all going to be tested in the furnace of life. And uh, there's going to be some hot trials. And we always ask the question, right? Well, why? Why? Because the devil always tempts us to destroy our faith. If we have been born again, Satan knows that he can't get our soul. He can't take us to hell. With him. The next best thing that he can do is destroy your testimony and destroy your faith so that we become uh, incompetent Christians. At least we can't lead somebody else to the Lord. Or maybe our life becomes so weak, our testimony becomes so weak that it actually prevents people from going. That, is, that would be Satan's next attempt then. And that's why trials come. It is Satan that tempts us. And of course, we, we well, wait a minute now. The Bible says that God allows trials. Yes, He does. But the temptation comes when Satan shows up. The trials come. The temptation comes with Satan. There's a difference. There's a difference in those two concepts. So the devil always tempts us to destroy our faith. He can't destroy our soul, which is his first intention. Then the next best thing is destroy our faith keep us defeated so our testimony will be rotten in his mind. And um, that, that would be terrible. I think one of the worst things that ever happened to a Christian is lose a testimony. Lose a testimony. God does allow the test. He does not tempt. Satan does that. When the temptation comes, when Satan taps us on the shoulder, we're in the trial, and the temptation comes, then we choose. Then we choose. We're either going to succumb to it, or we're going to stand up, and we will choose. <coughs> it, will, it will depend on how strong our faith is at the time. God is always, God always will allow the testing to come. To develop our faith so that he gets the honor he gets the glory 
and there'll be some glory to come from it as long as we um, remain faithful. It's often been said, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. I've always given Jerry Vimes the credit for that. Now, he may have got it from Adrian Rogers. I don't know. <laughs> but the first time I ever heard it, it was from Jerry Vimes, and I've, I've never forgotten it. False faith is going to wither from time to trial. I think a lot of people that we see that they were here and all of a sudden they're not, uh, that might not be a good sign. I mean, I'm not the judge. It's not my place. I'm just saying the Bible clearly says that they weren't of us because they never was of us. <coughs> their, their faith uh, faltered. When the test came, their uh, faith failed. True faith will always take deeper root. When the trials come and our faith starts withstands it, then our faith is strengthened. And then the next trial may be worse. And our faith can be strengthened. But God's going to get the honor and the glory for it. True faith will always grow. True faith brings glory to God. I think the Apostle Peter must have been well acquainted with these boys here in the book of Daniel because he used the metaphor of the fiery trial when he warned his readers of the persecutions that the church is going to experience. First Peter chapter one, verses seven, and then again in chapter four, verse 12. So the experience of these three men, these three Hebrew boys, will help us examine our own faith and what faith they had, what faith they had. When the trials come, our faith is tested, what's gonna be the outcome? So these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. Does God get the glory for it, or do we get the glory for it? A big difference there. So let's look at verses um, 1 to 7 to begin with. That's sort of an introductory. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, and the height was 60 cubits, and its width was 6 cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together, I'm going to read this just one time, satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, and magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces, the empire, to come to the dedication of the image which, the, which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now that word, had set up, occurs several times in, in this chapter. Uh, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, verse 5, verse 7, um, 14, 15, and 17. I mean, I didn't count them. Well, it's got to be six or eight times. He said, he set it up. So then all these um, officials... Uh, came to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And a herald cried aloud, To, to you is commanded. It was no suggestion. This is a command. It is required. When's that going to happen again? During tribulation. A herald cried aloud, to you it's commanded, peoples, nations, and languages, everybody. <clears throat> At the time you hear the sound of all these instruments, you'll fall down and worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the music, Everybody, all the people, all the nations, all the languages fell down and worshipped the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All right. As best I can determine, 
it has been about 20 years since the end of chapter 2. So this is not like this happened the next day. This event is 20 years later. 20 years have passed since Daniel and these three Hebrew boys was promoted. You know, after Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, you know, we just went over all that in chapter 2. And so now 20 years later, so this is going to be about 586 B.C. So what's going on at 586 B.C.? The complete destruction of Jerusalem and the burning of the temple. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar first came to power in like 602 or 5, whichever it was, he besieged Jerusalem and they capitulated, but he didn't destroy it. Remember? But then they showed out. It was a rebellion, and Nebuchadnezzar got ill about that. And so he knocked the walls down, destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, took away the, the rest of the gold in it. I mean, he just looted it, burned it to the ground. And then that temple wasn't restored until Herod, Herod's, uh, well, um, Nehemiah's time. We built the walls of the temple. So this is 586 BC, and so this is the time that Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. So in these verses, Nebuchadnezzar then has built an image of gold and has instructed or commanded that the people are going to fall down and worship this gold image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And he and that's mentioned several times here. <clears throat> Uh, so when Daniel explained the meaning of the successive metals in that massive image that we just studied, he identified Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold. So I believe Nebuchadnezzar then is motivated by his own pride, motivated by his own arrogance. And so he makes, makes this image of gold. <clears throat> the word image there implies that it is a human depiction. And so then there's speculation of, well, was it a depiction of Ellen? It would have been a hospital. Was it a depiction of Summer? It would have been just as nice. Uh, most likely, it was a depiction of his God. And a lot of commentators, and David Jeremiah is one of them, <clears throat> thinks that it was, it was his life. That makes the most sense. Because Nebuchadnezzar really thought he was a god. He, he, he did. He had that kind of arrogance about him. Uh, so he's, he's motivated then by his own pride and his own arrogance to make this image of gold. So he wasn't satisfied and content to be merely the head of gold. He, he wanted uh, him and his kingdom to be symbolized by an entire image of gold. And so he made it clear that uh, no empire, Daniel had made it clear that no empire is going to last forever, including the great Nebuchadnezzar. So his heart was all filled up with pride and uh, all the conquests that he had made, you know, conquering the known world at the time and all the building projects that he had done and is going on. <clears throat> and so remember in chapter 4, verse 28, he, he comes out of his palace and says, is this not great Babylon that I have built? So he, he did build some magnificent things. <clears throat> you know, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So he did some good things. They didn't do it for the right reason. But Nebuchadnezzar was also fearful and was concerned for his vast empire and for himself. And so he wants to make sure that the people are loyal to him and that there's going to be no rebellion. So one of the ways that you control people is through religion. That's why when the one world government comes, the Antichrist is going to fully understand that you can't control the whole world unless they're united in their religion. And 
so that's why he lies through his teeth to the Jews lies to the Muslims too lies to everybody to get everybody on board with a one world religion and eventually everybody figures out that that religion is that he's God <laughs> but he realizes that so Antichrist is plenty smart I mean he, God's a genius well he will be a genius and he may be alive today but he understands that you've got to get world religion to have world dominance or a world political system. You gotta have religion on board with it. I watched the thing on that last night, what you just talked about. And uh, the first thing is one one world which we all know that, one world religion. But even rewriting this. Yeah. And taking Jesus' name out. Oh yeah. Jesus got to go. Let me tell you something. They had, they had some preachers on there. That's what got me. They said, we'll see people be in heaven. And five of them, all five, said, yes, they will. Say that again. They said, all five, they were asked a question, whether there be gay people in heaven? And no. all five said, they will. They said, because, by God, they said, God's word says he loves everybody. He does. It's true. <laughs> true. But they're not. They're, and that's the problem. They're going to make it read the way they want it to read. And when you're talking about Satan, the way he goes about things, what makes it worse is when he has. I mean, you've been to the meetings out there on the, you know, where y'all went. The end fighting. Well, I believe this, but John Ed believes this one. Who are we going to believe? All they have to do is just change a few words in here, and they got it. Yeah. And then people don't, they, they will believe it because yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to follow everything what he's telling me to hear. Well, society and culture um, moves us in that direction too. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, those gay people that that's their lifestyle, and they chose that, and you know, God loves them, and so then it's easier and easier for us to get to the place that surely, then, um, there'll be. In heaven. Yeah. I mean, I've even seen John that they could be born that way. Yeah. And I thought, why don't you turn this? I said, I want to hear what this idiot's got to say. <laughs> well, sure. You need to be aware. Yeah. I mean, it just oh, yeah. That's come up too in that modern medical science is trying to use genetics yeah. to show that there's a gene right. that right. expresses and that you could be born that way. Hug, wash. Hogwash. Now that is absolutely contradictory to what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. And God uh, called it an abomination. That's right. And he burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground because of it. And clearly said that homosexuals and adulterers and, I mean, unrepentant mm -hmm. are not going to be there. That's right. And so, um, certainly a homosexual or any trans or perverted sexual sin can be forgiven. There's no doubt about that. But, but you don't, die on you your sin. You have to quit practicing what that is. Because well, that's what sin. repentance means, right? That's what I said. You can't say that I have repented and accepted Christ and trusted the Lord right. for salvation and continue to live in open rebellion against God. Right. That is not repentance. Change if you don't. <clears throat> That's exactly right, but but it gets easy then for a culture, though, to accept that because oh, some the theologians are saying, mm -hmm. and so and I want to believe that, so there you are. Um, so the answer to that question is no. You ain't got to tell me. <laughs> 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 For the benefit of everybody else. <laughs> Alright, so to be so his goal here in setting up this image is to get the whole empire on board with one religion. And you know, you get a world empire like this, and there's all kinds of different languages and different nationalities, and certainly different religions. And so he wants everybody unified. Mm -hmm. 
and you get everybody unified, then there's less chance of rebellion, right? So this is Nebuchadnezzar's goal. And so he wants to make sure that the people are loyal to him so that there be no rebellion. So he's worried about his own um, throne, even though Daniel's clearly said, it ain't gonna last, man. I mean, there's gonna be successive world empires. They're gonna come and go. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at this image then. The image is 60 cubits by 6 cubits. And so, by far, the, the, the standard for a cubit is 18 inches. Now, there's lots of debate about that, but I ain't going into that. That's, that's not what the study's about. So we're talking about something 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. That's a 10 to 1 ratio. I think it's going to be top heavy, isn't it? But boys, it's going to be visible for a long time. <laughs> I mean, 90 feet high. And uh, probably is made of wood and overlain with gold. I, I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar had that much gold in his treasury. I mean, he may have, but likely it was wood overlain with gold. And boy, was this a, an awesome sight. And, and I believe that it was uh, an image of him. I, I really, I mean, there's evidence for that, but there's also others that think otherwise. But an awesome sight here. And it, and it says that it's on the plain of Dura. Well, Dura is about six miles from Babylon. And, and the word here is Akkadian. Now back when we were studying about what Daniel had to go through, he was learned in all the languages and stuff. We, we learned that the Akkadian language was their language of religion. That was their religious, that was their secret, all their magic spells, how to turn a frog into a prince. You know, all that, uh, all that stuff was written in the Akkadian. It, so it was the religious language of Babylon. Uh, but maybe more importantly is on the plain of Dura, in this particular place, that's where the furnace was. <laughs> and so Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, he's already thought this thing through, right? He's going to build the image, and we're going to put it out here by the furnace, and everybody's going to show up, and there's going to be plenty of room, of course, and it's going to be able to be seen from a long distance. But anybody that don't bow down, they're going in the furnace. So that's why it's there. I will right, we'll talk about that furnace later. <coughs> well, I'm getting tired of talking about it now. Um, so there's difference of opinion again on, on the furnace. So it could have been a huge pot-bellied structure with an opening at the top and apparently uh, portholes within the side. And if that be the case, it'd be likely built of bronze in order for it to withstand intense heat. But uh, I'm not buying that one uh, because even bronze can be melted and um, you get a furnace roaring and you get billows in it and later on we're gonna see that Nebuchadnezzar said heated up seven times hotter. Well, that could mean uh, throw in seven lighter knots or does that mean you just turn the air to it, right? I mean, you just crank up the billows to these portholes and you can make a fire hotter by adding air, right, to it. And so I, I believe though that it's, it's a stone structure and it's, um, um, there's evidence that they were built like 30 feet square and they had four foot thick walls. So that then would be able to tolerate the intense heat. And, and they, they would use the furnaces, they were built for smelting ore. I mean, if you mine uh, ore out of the ground, whether it's iron or other, what you do is you heat it up so that it separates the dross and you get the metal, right? And then you can fashion the metal into swords or plowshares or you know whatever 
So I, I believe the structure was stone, uh, 30 foot square, and had four foot thick walls. Uh, and that would contain the intense heat. And it would also have the large opening in the top and most likely um, have had a domed shaped roof. And of course, it'd be steps up the side because that's where you would put in the fuel and the ore. And then there would be a, some kind of mechanism in the bottom to catch the liquid iron that would run off. So this, this is the, re the reason for the furnace was to smelt iron. That was the reason for it. Right? And it was probably built out there so that it would, um, I mean, this thing's gonna get hot, right? So you, you don't want that in town. And so there's a lot of reasons uh, for all this to work out that way. And so the steps up the side then would provide access for, um, and then, the reason that Nebuchadnezzar and his administrators could see into the furnace is because you, know, you get this picture of a 30 foot square stone structure, looks like a pillbox, but there were portals in the sides and that's where they would add the air. And so it'd be easy for anybody then to see from a distance even if there was somebody walking around in there. But that was the reason for the, them being able to see is because you had to have the portals there to blow air in to make the fire hotter. All right, so you get a, a mental image of this furnace. All right, so in verse two then, Nebuchadnezzar sends word to all of the empire, all of his administrators, all the top government officials, and they're supposed to come to the dedication of the image. And uh, there again, I've referenced that refers to a statue in human form. And so it's obvious uh, that Daniel's not here. And so one of the first things we want to try to address then is where's Daniel? I mean, he's one of the most important guys in the whole book, right? Where's Daniel? And so it's obvious he's not there because if he was, he'd probably be in the fire with them boys. Um, well, the best uh, explanation is probably Daniel was away on King's business. I mean, he's prime minister, right? So he would be meeting with foreign dignitaries or visiting. I mean, he's doing something else, he, but he's not, not there. And he certainly ain't dead. Daniel shows up uh, later, right? So, you know, but most Bible scholars agree that he was away on some kind of business. <clears throat> All right, so the next thing we want to point out is why is Nebuchadnezzar doing this? Um, we've mentioned that to, to unite the kingdom religiously, um, but Babylon had grown a lot during Nebuchadnezzar's tenure, and um, a, a lot of people have been born and there's been more people moved in um, outside of the empire and you first you say well, well he didn't capture everything well he captured everything he needed capturing in order to be a dictator but there were still people on the fringes or in spots that like, immigrated in and um, they had brought in their own deities you know their own false gods so the Phoenicians had the, their Baal, their Ashtaroth, uh, Carchemish, they had their Hittite deities. Uh, the Arabians had dozens of deities. Uh, Moloch, Murdoch, Dagon, Ishtar, I mean the list goes on and on. So in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, such fragmentation would breed uh, strife and it would threaten, threaten the unity. So, um, this new um, empire then needed to be unified and uh, he, he wanted to unite everybody around worshiping him. And so I wonder if, if Nebuchadnezzar knew Nimrod's story. 
remember Nimrod was actually the first one that tried to do a world empire, build the Tower of Babel. Of course, God burned that down. But that would be recorded in history. So you have to ask yourself the question that if Nebuchadnezzar knew about Nimrod's story. Well, Hitler certainly recognized the importance of, of religious unity. And um, the Antichrist will one day recognize the importance of religious unity as well. In 1930, Hitler wrote this. One cannot be a good German and deny God. Now, he's an atheist. Hitler's an atheist. was an atheist. I mean, he ain't now. I've often said that uh, I've talked to a lot of I've talked to a lot of atheists in my in my career. God's put a bunch of those guys, and uh, you know I'm, I'm in a science environment. I've done research projects with a lot of guys with PhD degrees, and a lot of those guys were atheists. So I've talked to a lot of atheists, and one of the things I've commented and. Uh, tactfully is that well you won't be one forever you just won't be one forever and I'm not sure Kevin that they really are I mean they, they say it with their mouths but I don't know the <laughs> one that blew my mind was the one you told me about you know Dr. Bertrand I, 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 you know, you know, well, I mean he was always respectful oh, yeah. at the meetings that we had when you say bless him he never and he and I probably had the most frank discussions of any, any of the atheists that I ever talked to. He was very respectful. I mean, he got it that I was mm -hmm. the way I was, and I got it that he was the way he was. And I challenged him many uh, times to read the Bible. He admitted to me one time that he had read the Quran. I said, well, why don't you read the Bible? He said, well, I think, well, I just might. I said, are you afraid to? He said, oh, no, no, I'm not afraid to. And I said, well, why don't you read it? I said, it'll change your life if you do. And so I don't know. But you know, when he retired, um, we met up. I had moved to Alma at the time to be the area of blueberry specialist. And the last time we talked was in the Alma office. And he said to me, I'm going to miss our lively discussions. And I haven't seen him since. So that was in uh, 2005 or six. Yeah, a, a brilliant pathologist. I, and I've done a lot of research work with Dr. Petrano. Talked to him at length on a lot. On evolution was our biggest topic, and uh, he he would get fr so frustrated. I am totally off my notes here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you think the people out of way. Yeah. First thing you think of, they want to argue the point. But this guy didn't. I'm telling you, when I say respectful, yeah. if man would come here and sit down, you would never know. Yeah. And smart. Yeah, brilliant. Really high IQ. And um, done a lot of good work for agriculture. Yeah. I mean, give him the credit. But the atheist, sure was. Now, Hitler wrote this in, um, what, what did my notes say? What time? 1930. 1930. So he's not up to power yet. But a good German uh, can't deny God. But to avow faith in the eternal Germany. Now follow this, and I'm I'm quoting him so that I don't miss nothing. He's he's getting around to the back door, right? But to avow faith in the eternal Germany. To avow faith is to avow faith in the eternal God. So you see how he's getting to it. You're a good German. You can't deny God. But Germany is eternal, just like God is. Connection. Connection. Whoever serves Hitler then serves Germany. Don't mess up. And therefore, whoever Germany... Uh, then Germany 
serves God. So if you're a good German, you don't deny God. You serve Germany, but I'm in charge here. And so here's the connection that he's made, and the German people bought it. A very intelligent people. So whoever Germany serves, serves God. And Hitler was an atheist. But he knew the power of religion. And so he just twisted it such that if you serve Germany, you're serving me and you're serving God too. Let's make the connection. He attacked the Christian faith, and particularly the gospel of Jesus Christ. He made no attempt to stamp out faith in God. His policy uh, was even more blasphemous than that. His, his attempt was to replace Jesus Christ and to counterfeit true religion rather than to dismiss it. Counterfeit it rather than dismiss it. So you can't dismiss it, but you can counterfeit it. And people will buy that. Hitler's policy was to try to replace Christ to create an anti-type of Christianity. That was his goal. And to make himself God. You just do it in a roundabout way. Tell the people what they want to hear. If you're not founded in the word, not founded in the truth, people will buy into that kind of thing. And you can get fooled. You gotta know what the word of God says. You gotta know what the truth is so that you can recognize a lie. I've often used the illustration about bankers. You don't have to teach Ellen how to counterfeit a hundred dollar bill a dozen ways. All she's got to know is what is the, what is it supposed to look like. All she needs to know is what does a hundred dollar bill supposed to look like. And then anything else is a counterfeit. And so we we read the Bible and we understand the truth of God's word, and then anything that don't measure up is counterfeit. Antichrist is going to do the same thing. One world religion is going to be necessary for one world government. And we are trying to get there ASAP. So all these government officials representing every level of government, from all the provinces from India to Ethiopia and, and north to Asia Minor, and um, I made myself a note here, no RSVP. So... You know, you send out a wedding invitation and you put at the bottom, RSVP. And what that stands for in French is Respondez-vous s'il vous plaît. Respond, let me know if you're coming. There's no RSVP here, Trish. <laughs> it ain't optional. <laughs> if you got the invitation, you go. You don't have to respond, I think I'm going to take that. No, you go. Everybody was required to go. So the entire empire, I'm out of time now, was summoned to worship this gold image. And the word worship occurs a dozen times in this chapter. So th this is clearly a religious act. And so, um, so here's this man in chapter 2 of verse 47 who just today said, Truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets. And now here in chapter 3, it's 20 years later now, he's made an image of gold, probably of himself, and he's going to require everybody to worship that. Something has changed. I mean, he done for God what he said. Couldn't have done it to make himself feel good. So the point is, is he never was sincere about what he said at that time. So here's, let me make this one point and we'll have to quit for tonight. People can say really sincere things. And if you don't know them, you, you may just have to take that at face value. But don't just fall in behind someone just because they said something. Even if it's really sincere. It, it usually takes a period of time 
before you really figure out who a person is. And so how often has it been shown that a person says some sincere things and gets in the position of power and then all of a sudden some true colors start shining? So just a word of caution. Nebuchadnezzar said it, but he wasn't sincere because look at what he's doing now. And I think he comes around later and I'll make a case for that. Lord God, thank you for this class. I thank you for your uh, attendance and your attention. God, my prayers always open our hearts and our souls and our minds. Help us to receive the truth in your word. God, help us to apply it so that a lost world can see that there's a difference in the life of a Christian. They want what we have. That we would be more salty and we would be a brighter light. And it would bring honor and glory to your name. Our witness and our testimony would be strong. Our faith would be strengthened. And all for your honor and for your glory. That's my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.